Our lecturer this evening is freehold born Glenn Cashin, who I've gotten to know pretty well over the last year or so. And I can tell you, he's just a really wonderful guy. He's a fantastic researcher and you're going to love tonight's presentation. So without further ado, Glenn Cashin. Thank you, Dana, and good evening. And uh, Dana, a special thank you for all the support that you uh, and technical expertise that you provided. I, this presentation wouldn't be possible without your help. You know, as reflected in this quote from Field of Dreams, <clears throat> baseball is indeed a part of our past and particularly of my past. This narrative depicts the emergence and growth of baseball in a small town in New Jersey that is Freehold, my hometown. The following story while about Freehold was replicated in hundreds of small towns in America. The names of the towns of the teams and some of the key players are freehold teams and freehold personalities. However, the same baseball story is universal. Also, the following narrative is filled with my family history, as you will soon see. <clears throat> this photo was taken in 1870. It depicts kids choosing sides for a baseball game, starting with a bat toss and hands upon hands on the bat up until the knob of the bat is reached. The last player grabs the knob of the bat and spins the bat around three times. And if he succeeds, he gets the, to pick the first player. We were still using this approach when I was a youngster in the 1940s and 1950s. Uh, the birth of baseball was by many in the, in the olden days considered to be attributed to Admir Hap Doubleday uh, in Cooperstown in 1839. In fact, Doubleday was at West Point in 1839 and never claimed to have anything to do with baseball. Baseball evolved, it was not invented. Variations of the game are recorded as old cat, town ball, stick ball, ball playing, base, baseball, two words. Uh, Princeton University actually banned base play, baseball playing in 1787 as quote, low and unbecoming gentlemen students an exercise attended with great danger, unquote. And elements of English uh, game rounders and cricket did become part of the baseball jargon. Alexander Joy Cartwright, with the assistance of Doc Adams, drafted the first set of baseball rules in 1845. Cartwright was a member of the Knickerbocker Volunteer Fire Company and the Knickerbocker Baseball Club. The rules stipulated men stationed at first, second, and third base around a perfect square of 90 feet between bases. No longer would a base runner be out by being hit by a thrown ball. There would be nine players on each side and batters or strikers would be bat, would bat in order. The rule of three hands out, all out, replaced the cricket rule whereby the side continued to bat until the whole team was out. And the first game played under these Knickerbocker rules took place in Hoboken on June 19th, 1846. The games are commonly called match games it's from a cricket term. The catcher was called the behind. Anyone who caught a fly ball was called a fly catcher. And actually uh, to be caught out uh, in those early days, if the ball even bounced, you were out. If you caught it on one bounce, you were out. And that lasted until 1865. The umpire and scorer were important positions approved by both teams. And for many years, the scorekeeper was actually noted in the box score. And the underhand toss enabled the batter or strikers to really pound the ball and there were many, many errors or muffs as they were called. Thus, the scores of games was more like that of a football game. For example, on May 21st, 1870, Old Mammoth, 58, Minerva, three. Gloves evolved over time as did the tools of ignorance for the catcher. And the pitcher's distance also evolved uh, reaching the 60 feet, six inches in 1893 with the creation of a pitcher's mound. Now to freehold. Some reason we, we one more. Uh, let's just go back a couple. I think. Uh, let's try one more. No, uh, this is the next one. Okay, okay, we'll go stay with this one. Then. Okay. The um, the baseball ad that you see here uh, from 1857 essentially lit a fire in freehold. The game was was well known by this time. Uh, it was starting to catch on with, with a real uh, emphasis throughout New Jersey, with Newark sporting 52 baseball clubs in 1860. Towns with good rail service were attracting teams throughout New Jersey. This 57 ad in the local newspaper 
lit a fire. And, and the fire was create, created there for the Freehold Baseball Club a year later. And it was organized and numbered about 20 members upon its initial organization. The original organizer was a guy named Mr. Lokerson, proprietor of Freehold Cigar Shop, that's a S -E -A -S -E -G -A -R shop. And while there was no record of the performance of this team, the stated moral code was, quote, any member using vulgar or profane language upon the ground shall be fined a sum not over $1 and suspended from playing until the same be paid. And that team met twice a week on a property which later became the Freehold High School. This is one of the earliest recorded box scores at Freehold Baseball. Box scores actually originated uh, approximately 1859 by a fellow, a newspaper reporter named uh, Henry, Harry Chadwick. So this 19, uh, 1866, note the hyphenated baseball, uh, the name of the score and the fly catchers. Um, the Atlantic team beat the Institute 30 to 17 in this game. And the Friel Institute was one of the best known prep schools in the state and was in existence from 1844 to 1904. The team later became known as the Nataya Baseball Club. Now, Nataya is a Cherokee word, and it is really still unclear why they chose that name. One of the earliest baseball clubs to be uh, organized was the Mammoth Baseball Club in uh, 1872. This club had nearly 75 honorary members. And around this time, there was a letter that uh, one Mr. Brick Pomeroy penned. Uh, and it, I think it, it bears interest to the, to the, to the listeners. Uh, let me, let me uh, for sake of uh, timing, I'll try and run through this rather quickly. Quote, the doctor said we needed exercise. Doctor knows. He told us to join baseball. We joined bought a book of instructions and for five days studied it wisely. Then we bought a sugar scoop cap, a red belt, a green shirt, yellow trousers, pumpkin colored shoes, a paper collar, a purple necktie and moved gently to the ground. There was an umpire. His position was a hard one. He sits on a box and yells foul. His duty is severe. I hit the ball with a club and drove it gently upward. The ball lit into the pitcher or his hands and somebody said he caught a fly. I turned to see how he was making it, and a mule kicked me in the cheek. The man said it was a ball. This was an eventful chap who first invented baseball. It's such fun. I had played five games, and this is the glowing result. $27 paid out for things, one banged eye, one broken little finger, one bump on the head, one thumb dislocated, and one dislocated shoulder from trying to throw a ball a 1,000 yards. I don't think I like the game. I sleep nights dreaming of hot balls, flies, fouls, and descending skyrockets, but I am proud of my proficiency. And as Mr. Pomeroy writes, P.S., all ladies in favor of universal suffering are invited to join the club, unquote. Well, <laughs> this, this baseball club of Mammoth uh, with the honorary members was one of six ball clubs at that time in 1872. And with the Mammoth Club, Freehold had, also had Andes, Atlantics, Dolly Vardens, Independents, and the Natahalias. In June, Mama steadily, de soundly defeated the Natahalias 40 to eight and were cheered with many spectators. A large flagpole had been erected and on the pole flew the national colors and the new pennant of the Mammoth Ball Club as depicted on this chart. Many match games are held by these clubs. Princeton University nine played the Mammoths on June 12th, 1872 and beat the local team 23 to 18. Quote, the playing on both sides was very fair, but few muffs or overthrows being made. The strangers were hospitably entertained by the mammoths at their respective homes. Rutgers also played in Freehold in 1872. Now, just as the Cherokee name, <coughs> uh, Taya, was a bit strange, so too were these two Freehold names. On the right, you see the Dolly Varden name, originating from a Charles Dickens character in one of the, his two historical novels called Barnaby Rudge, written in 1841. The name was a symbol of fiery endure, fi feisty endurance. 
The Modox team no, noted on the left, who was playing the team called the uh, Magnolias. Uh, the Modox is another strange team that does not seem to have any relevance to Freehold. The Modoc Indian tribes in 1872 were located in Northern California, and there was a U.S. Modoc war that took place from November 1872 to June 1873. Obviously, members of the Modoc team felt a kinship with the Modoc tribe. In 1887, my uh, ancestor Jim Fitzgibbons played in his first game as a catcher with the Freehold Orientals. And in an 1887 game in Red Bank with Mammoth playing the Red Bank Eurekas at Red Bank, the result was almost disastrous. The Red Bank spectators kept ranting against the umpire, a fellow named Tom Arrowsmith from Freehold. And before long, apples and sticks were being thrown at the umpire with chance of mob him. As the crowd rushed toward him, Mr. Arrowsmith's father, who happened to be a spectator at the game, drew a revolver and said, the first one who touches him gets shot. Peace was restored, and when Red Bank refused to play, Freehold was awarded victory by a forfeit. 1891 was a busy baseball year. There were new teams created, new teams and teams were reorganized. Uh, local businesses started to field their own teams. Women were reported to attend games and, and, quote, add greatly to the tone of the assembled, unquote. There was even a willingness to pay to attend games at 10 cents per person at a July game. The Mammoths, the team, the Mammoths, continued to play great ball. Sometimes there wouldn't be enough players on hand to fill the team, and spectators would, quote, turn up their trousers over patent leather shoes, roll up the sleeves of a freshly laundered bosom shirt, and step on the playing field, unquote. The shortstop for the Mammoths, a guy called Jameson, was called the dummy because he couldn't speak or hear. But there were, quote, never, it was never a play made that he doesn't see unquote. And this was the year uh, my grandfather and his family moved from Baltimore to Freehold. And uh, my grandfather's brother, Tony McNicholas, uh, started playing and he remained an outstanding pitcher for the next 10 years. On July 4th, 1891, the Rothschild Shirt Factory was pitted against the Stokes File Factory with the Shirt Factory winning by 18 to 12. And in 1901, the newly formed Freehold Baseball Club won the Monmouth County Championship with Edward Cashin, my uncle, as manager. This is the photo of the Monmouth Baseball Club taken in 1891. William Wesley Crawford is in the top row, fourth from the left. Distinguished looking gentleman there. Perhaps Tony McNicholas is in this photo also. However, unfortunately, I cannot uh, identify him. Wes Crawford was involved in a couple of interesting games. The first occurred on August 10th, 1891. The Mammoths lost to Tom Jiver by a close score of 13 to 14. The Mammoths lineup remained pretty much the same except for one substitution. Wes Crawford took the place of Harry Thompson in left field for two innings, while Harry went uptown and sold a sewing machine. Apparently Harry felt his job as salesman for Singer sewing machines was more important than playing left field for the Mammoths. The second interesting game that Wes was involved in was in July 1905. In that month, there were two games between the Fats and the Thins of Freehold. That's what I said, the Fats and the Thins. The first game was won by the Fats. Knowing the odds were against the Fats, they hatched a plan, rumor has it, in the first game to hypnotize the umpire and put the score to sleep while the lean men making runs. Don't think that really happened. But Wes Crawford was the pitcher for the leans and had difficulty getting the fat men out. Of course, the fat men had active substitutes to run for them. Otherwise, they would have shaken to pieces running about the diamond. My uncle Edward Cashin was one of the runners. In the second game, the Thins won by 29 to 8. And some of the lady friends of the players organized themselves into a Red Cross team, Red Cross Corps, and set up a hospital tent just in case. They also charged for the sale of ice cream, lemonade, and Sterry's cocoa which with the gate receipts netted over $15. Another baseball team, and now baseball has become uh, one word, was started in May, 1891. There were, uh, the organizers of this team came up with three variations of a name. The first was the Keg Drainers. The second was the Freehold Temperance Baseball Club. Interesting choices. And finally, the Wild Ducks. 
And the Wild Ducks was chosen, including the provision for, of no Sunday baseball. The leader of this team was Charlie Human, a butcher from South Street. The Mommins and the Wild Ducks played some exciting games. For example, a few of their opponents were the Brooklyn Barretts, the Brooklyn Ferns in 1897. They also played against the Unions of New York and the Mineolas of Brooklyn in 1893. On June 24th, 1893, the Mammoths were pitted against the Princeton Giants. The Giants, uh, I quote, a nine of colored waiters from the hotels of Princeton had defeated the Mammoths two weeks previously. The teams were both stronger than before and the game was one of their best ever played in Freehold. It being anybody's game until the ninth inning. McNicholas, my great uncle, pitched a strong game, striking out 15 men. He struck out five in succession in the sixth, seventh, and eighth innings, unquote. In the end, the Princeton Giants prevailed six to nine. These were the first recorded games of black baseball team playing in Freehold. And my uncle, great uncle, uh, Tony McNicholas, in that decade of 1891 to 1901, he averaged seven strikeouts, actually nine strikeouts per game. Not bad. So here are two good photos of a couple of teams around the turn of the century. The 1897 Veterans versus Sons of Rest game was a game between college boys and their fathers. The Veterans won the game 14 to 10. E.I. Vanderveer, who's on the far right, barely see him in that picture, played right field. And $26.25 was collected and donated to the Public Drinking Fountain Fund. And that Public Drinking Fountain Fund was actually uh, built and placed in front of the, at that time, the courthouse on Main Street in Freehold in 1899. The photo on the right from 1904 is one of the teams managed by E.I. Vanderveer. Shown and he has stood this time, obviously shown in the in the front rows in the back row center. Can't miss uh, EI with his uh, with his mustache. The Rothschild Shirt Factory team was reorganized in 1901 at the home of my uncle Edward Cashin. Edward was named the manager, and the team played a few more seasons. Edward would go on to manage the Catholic Baseball Club, a team with a simple name of Freehold, managed initially by William Freeman also started in 1901 with Ed Cash and following as manager and then E.I. Vanderveer became its longtime manager. This team played Matawan in June 1901 and had a pitcher who was impervious to spectator yapping. The Matawan fans yelled and screamed, but Jones, the pitcher, just smiled and kept getting the batters out. After all, reminiscent of the dummy of 1891, Jones was deaf and dumb and thought the throng was just cheering him on. 1905 to 1921 was an interesting time for freehold baseball. <coughs> Black baseball teams started to appear on Freeman's freehold's diamonds, and the Cashins started to again uh, not only manage the teams but start to play ball. New teams appeared, some for many seasons, others very short seasons. For example, the freehold seniors lasted from 1904 to 1910, very respectable tenure. And they played teams like Elizabeth, Carteret, Westside Atlantic Club, Jersey City, Newark. And in 1904, the senior secretary, again, this guy, my uncle Edward Cashin, was responsible for scheduling their 50 game season. Other teams during that time frame, which were of shorter duration, the Tigers in 1905, the Athletics in 1913, the American Steam Laundry uh, business on located on Bound Avenue had a team in 1905. And the rug mill, uh, recently uh, arriving in Freehold as A&M Karagushan, the rug mill athletic club was formed in 1907 with my father, Dim, uh, becoming a catcher for that club. Some departments at the rug mill, the Creelers and Wheelers, decided to have their own teams in, in, in 1912. And let, not to be left out, the, uh, the town's folks of downtown Freehold decided to have their own game and match the West Main Street against East Main Street in 1922. In July 1920, there were 400 in Lincoln Place to see Freehold's nine beat Princeton Athletic Club in a double header. Quote, heavy hitter Mutt Myers driving out a homer. Quote, in October 1920, a duck dinner banquet at the Mammoth House was held for the entire team. 
Among the players in attendance were Fred Quinn, John Carswell, Walt Briggs, Harry Daly, Oodles Vanderveer, the son of E.I. Vanderveer, and also participating, uh, as E.I. Vanderveer called him, his faithful umpire, my father, Jim Cashin. On July 15th, 1921, there was a double header at, uh, in Freehold at Lincoln Street, Lincoln Place Field, that drew 1,500 fans with my father umpiring at that time. By that time, my father had taken down the uh, catcher's mitt and uh, donned the umpire's gear. The population of Freehold at 1920, to give you an idea, was 4,768. So 1,500 turnout wasn't bad. Freehold's first night game under the lights was played on July 9th, 1910 on the Broadway grounds against the Cherokee Indians traveling baseball team. The Indians brought 50 in in incandescent arc lights and their own band. Uh, this, this, <laughs> this team uh, played in that, as I said, the Broadway field, which became the, uh, the current Freehold High School. As the case throughout baseball, uh, baseball teams in Freehold were segregated for decades. <clears throat> the earliest uh, newspaper article uh, of a Freehold colored team was 1905. And of course, during this formative years of baseball, the term colored was the accepted usage when referring to African Americans. This colored team had games reported in 1913 against the Athletics, the Freehold Firemen in 1930, a team in Long Branch in 1932 and at Camp Dix in 1942. The Excelsior Baseball Club had an outstanding team and played for seven seasons. The Freehold Baseball Club beat the Excelsiors on the Broadway grounds in September 1916 with my father catching. In July 1917, though, the Excelsiors came back playing against the Freehold Club and had a field day, beating them in a doubleheader 28 to three and 30 to three. The last recorded game of the Excelsiors was July 1922 when they lost four to one to Camp Dix Military Ball Club on the Broadway grounds. There were also colored traveling ball clubs during this time. The Royal Colored Giants of Brooklyn played the Freehold Seniors on September 12, 1905, <clears throat> with the Giants winning six to four. This is a photo of their 1916 team. In 1926, the Giants would come to the Jersey Shore and my father would play a major role in that game. Also playing in Freehold uh, during that time frame was the Philadelphia Colored Giants who beat the Freehold Club two to nothing on July 30th, 1910. So in Freehold's early days, all games were played on weekdays. Sunday was excluded. It was outlawed. And while the general public wasn't against Sunday baseball, church leaders were violently opposed. In 1908, Monmouth County church officials issued a resolution stating, quote, Sunday baseball brings with it the attendant evils of the demoralization of the young, the serious violation of the Holy Sabbath, together with drinking, betting, and fighting, unquote. In 1921, a petition was signed by a thousand voters in Freehold in support of Sunday baseball. E.I. Vanderveer spearheaded the drive. Affidavits were filed by three individuals to the effect that Sunday games were orderly and that the only noise in the neighborhood was caused by hand clapping, which only lasted a few minutes. One of the individuals, one of the three individuals signing that petition was Mrs. Jenny McNicholas, my grandmother, who lived a half a block away from the Lincoln Place field. E.I. Vanderveer's teams were always tough competitors. In 1922, Friel won the 3M League, that is the Monmouth, Mercer, Middlesex counties. In 1923 and 25, they won the Monmouth County Championship. At the end of the 23 championship win over Bordentown, or at the uh, end of, at the win, there were 1,500 fans in attendance. Their record in 1923 was 45 wins, 17 losses. Pitcher Ray O'Gorick established a record for New Jersey semi-pro pitcher when he won 31 out of 37 games and fanned 238 in 277 innings. The local media was actually complaining that, quote, the games were too one-sided and teams of better players should be sought. <laughs> well, they won the 1925 championship before 1,000 spectators at the driving park grounds by the Freehold Raceway today 
beating the Norwoods of Long Branch seven to two. Of all the freehold baseball teams, and there were more than 50 during this 100 plus year period, the freehold fireman team stands out. It boasted 16 years of operation and five championships. Under the leadership of Joe Crotchfelt, this team was unbeatable during the early 1930s. Starting in 1923 at Lincoln Place Field before a few hundred fans, it moved to the Fireman's Field on Manalpin Avenue in 1934 and drew thousands of fans to their games. The games were played at twilight after supper and according to a local reporter, quote, attending them will aid digestion, unquote. The powerful lineup included Fred Quinn, Eddie King, Charlie Luganetti, Oodles Vanderveer, and Bill Rhodes. In August, 1936, Friel fireman Fred Quinn, later Mayor Friel, pitched a perfect game, beating Fort Monmouth 12 to nothing, complimenting his no-hit game while he was in high school. Fred would throw right-handed in one game and pitch left-handed in the next, an amazing pitcher. This is a photo of the 1922 Friel baseball club managed by E.I. Vanderveer. E.I. is in the third row again. He seems to always hold that position in that pose with his, with his mustache and with his son, Alva Oodles, to his left. E.I. could be called the grandfather of freehold baseball. He managed freehold ball clubs from 1904 to 1934, then managed the freehold firemen in 1938. He was selected to manage the 1934 Monmouth County All-Star team. And when the freehold Little Bigger League started in 1951, E.I. was the commissioner of the league. Now, aside from his baseball, E.I. was an excellent shooter. And he took pride in the fact that he had beat Annie Oakley in a shooting match. This is the Freehold High School baseball team of 1922. In the first row, uh, second from the right, is Eddie King. Eddie was an outstanding pitcher for the Freehold Firemen and other teams in the 1920s and 30s. My father, David Demers Cashin, called Dim. It's a little confusing because my brother was called Dim also. But let's, let's stay with my father here. He started playing ball with the American Steam Laundry Team in 1905 and was an outstanding catcher from 1907 to 1919, playing primarily on the freehold team, managed first by his brother, Edward Cashin, and then with, by E.I. Vanderveer. He also played on the rug mill team and other local teams. So as I said earlier, he, he took his catcher's mitt, put it on the shelf, and donned the umpire's gear in 1920. And he became a, an umpire with great notoriety. In 1921, a reporter notes, quote, he knows the rules and inside baseball and keeps his eagle eyes on the ball, unquote. In 1923, another reporter following a game between a couple of prep schools states, quote, Dim is pr proving a fine fellow with the younger students, unquote. He became known throughout central New Jersey for his umpiring skills and his gregarious nature. And in 1926, he umpired the game of his life, which is the game depicted on this uh, chart with my father as the umpire. This is October 11th, 1926, the day after the Yankees lost the World Series to St. Louis Cardinals. Babe Ruth and his all-star baseball team held an exhibition game at Bradley Beach. My father, Jim Cashin, was the umpire behind the plate. At his second time at bat, the Babe fouled off two pitches. He then watched a pitch for a called strike, called by my father. Bruce's all-star team lost to the Brooklyn Royal Colored Giants by a score of three to one. The newspaper account the following day reported, Cashin, quote, Cashin behind the plate umpired the game in a credible manner, unquote. Many years later, in 1938, in a group discussion at the Freehold Courthouse, attorney Izzy Friedman brought up the Bradley Beach game. My father responded that Babe turned around and remarked, quote, well, I guess you're right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so here's a photo of the fireman team that I referenced earlier, that great team with long tenure and five championships. And this is the uh, tail end of their time frame, not the very end, but just close to it, 1938, after Crotchfeld had left as manager and E.I. Vanderveer became the manager. Um, now, we, now we move to a guy, Frankie Hayes. Frankie Hayes is an adopted son of Freehold. <laughs> he was from Jamesburg, attended Pennington Seminary based upon his baseball skills, and he played for freehold teams in 1932 and 1933, the latter year under E.I. Vanderveer. In 1934, 
He played for the Philadelphia Athletics, was sent back for the minors briefly, and went back to the Athletics and played for several major other major league teams. He was a six-time All-Star and holds the record for consecutive games by a catcher, 320 between the years 1946 and 48. He caught Bob Feller's 1946 no-hitter and provided the only run in the game with a home run in the ninth inning. His family moved to East Main Street in Freehold circa 1935, and his younger brother was an outstanding catcher for Freehold High School. However, the main interesting aspect of, <coughs> of Frankie took place in 1934. Connie Mack took an all-star team to Japan for a series of exhibition games, including <coughs> included on the all-star roster were Babe Ruth, Lou Gehrig, Jimmy Fox, Lefty Gomez, and a couple of catchers, Charlie Berry from the Athletics and Mo Berg from the Cleveland Indians. <coughs> they were scheduled to be the catchers, but Charlie Berry came down with an appendicitis problem and couldn't make it. So Frankie Hayes became the second catcher. The team's reception when they arrived in Tokyo was outstanding, with over 100,000 lining the Ginza to see Ruth and cheer the Bambino. Mo Berg, a graduate of Princeton and Columbia, and fluent in several languages, some say more than a dozen languages, <coughs> didn't catch many games. He would dress in local garb, go to the highest building in Tokyo, take out his movie camera, and film the surrounding area for hours. Approximately seven and a half years later, Berg would turn over the films to the FBI and other intelligence agencies, and they were used to provide Jimmy Doolittle with intelligence for the bombing of Tokyo. Mo Berg was an early associate of the Office of Strategic Services, the precursor to the CIA. And here is Mo Berg with his camera in Tokyo in 1934. All right, here's a photo of the 1937 National Lead Team. National Lead was a company located in Perth Amboy. Which, was won, which won the Central Jersey Industrial League Championship. Dim, my brother, is the third, in the second row, third from the left. Dim could be called the father of baseball, unlike E.I. will call him the grandfather. Dim will call the, free, the father of free old baseball. He started playing in 1933 with the American Legion. Dim lived and breathed baseball. He played for numerous local clubs. He pitched a no-hitter for the Friel Fireman in 1938, and pitched a one hitter the next time out. He played for the Friel Cardinals, Friel Holy Name, English Town Sporting Club, Belmar All Star, Red Bank Pirates, Belmar Braves, Brooklyn Bushwicks, Fredward Friel Golstons, Friel Merchants, Friel Townsmen, and I probably missed a couple of teams. He was under contract with the Washington Senators in 1940. He played in the Kingston, New York team in the Colonial League in 1948 and 49. And in addition to his pitching prowess, he was a fearsome slugger. Now note in this photo also, the fellow directly in the center on the second row, Dim's, uh, his name is Hank Skank. Hank was an important member of Freehold's baseball history. Hank worked in the national lead for over 30 years and played on that same team with my brother in 1937, the championship team. And then he went on to uh, become member of the Freehold Holy Name team and eventually the Freehold Golston team organized in 1938. Hank was the first black ball player to play in a white baseball team in Freehold. Hank was a very good pitcher, although like many players, played many positions. Hank became an outstanding umpire and was umpiring when I was playing ball. Like many Freehold men, Hank was, a dedic was dedicated to baseball. A case in point occurred in 1937. Hank's wife <coughs> went into sudden labor and there was not enough time to drive the one half hour to Fitkin Hospital. So Hank Russ Mabel to Doc Reynolds at, a mini, at the mini Freehold Hospital on Main Street. Doc Reynolds delivered their precious daughter, Roberta, and Hank stood tall and proud, wearing his baseball uniform. <laughs> okay, so pre-World pre War II saw several teams in action. The Cubs, the Freehold AC, the Trilons, the Cosmos, the initial Golston team, and several black teams. Charlie Malkovitz, also Malco, managed the Trilons and the Freehold AC clubs. Charlie was another of Freehold's baseball elite. He was a dedicated baseball supporter, was instrumental in the later creation of the Freehold Babe Ruth League, and actually was my coach when I played in the Babe Ruth League. Okay, here we have the House of David. 
The House of David played many games in Freehold. It was founded in 1903 in Michigan. Their traveling bearded team traveled throughout the country. On May 30th, 1940, they met the Freehold Holy Name team with my brother Jim as the Holy Name pitcher. The House of David brought their own lights and delighted the crowd with their antics and good ball playing. They were credited with the invention of the pregame batting exercise called the pepper game. For those baseball enthusiasts, I think you'll know what that means. If not, I'll explain it later. They also were credited with, uh, I'm not sure this is true, but they were credited with creating and inventing the uh, automatic pin setting machine used in bowling alleys, strange as that may seem. Now, one of the pitchers on their team was a free old native, Michael Janesco. And my brother, Jim, named the House of David player, Jimmy Woods, as the best first baseman he had ever seen. According to Jim, quote, Woods couldn't hit the side of a barn, but he was the first base what Goose Tatum was to basketball, unquote. The Friel Cosmos team was a very successful team. In operation of Friel from 1938 to 1943, Gibby Toon was the key pitcher for the Cosmos, including a 20 strikeout performance against West Belmar in 1938. The team, team was organized at Goldstein store on Center Street in March, 1938. Now the number of black teams, <coughs> baseball teams are shown on this slide. There could have been more, more, but these are the recorded game results that I found. I had mentioned the colored giants and the Excelsiors. The 40 AC team played during the 1928-29 season and was in the same league as the Freehold Firemen. The Freehold Grays had a good three season run. The Freehold Eagles prominent in 1940-41, Dunbar's in 39, and the Brown Bombers in 44. <clears throat> the Brown Bombers included Ira Bolden, later an umpire at Lincoln Place grounds. This is a, a photo of the first season of the Freehold Golston, sponsored by A&M Karagushin, the rug mill. It was formed in March 1938, initially piloted by Percy Anderson. In mid-season, Dick Skein took over the reins, and the end of the, uh, their season, uh, their tenure in 1939, Roger Yard was the manager. Many of the names are familiar to local fans, Leighton, Kazava, McGacken, Quinn, Arbach, Thompson, McGrory, Cashin. Dim is in the second row center, and Hank Skank, as I referenced earlier, is up there on the, on the top left. In May 1939, the Golstons turned in a rare triple play, thanks to McGacken, Yard, Grofe, and Thompson. Also in 1940, the female employees of the rug mill took to the diamond. Quote, young girls play ball on the diamond of the Friel Military School and Institute place. The style of play is similar, but naturally played in a more restrained manner. The Messrs. Karagushin equipped the boys, the girls, with uniforms. The spirit of baseball has gripped all the employees and are doing their bit by attendance, contributing to the free will offering at the games and purchasing posters for their automobiles, unquote. With the end of the war, baseball players were anxious to get back on the diamond. Players from the free will trilons, the Cosmos, and the early Golston team joined to become the new 1946 Golston team. Gene Briggs managed the team, assisted by Hank Skank. This newly constituted Golston team was formidable. The 1946 photo shows a variety of uniforms. The team was, quote, funded with $100, and the money was gone the first few weeks of the campaign. The only way Gene Briggs, the manager, was able to get on with such a paltry sum was by reneging on uniforms. The men brought whatever uniforms they had. The only thing they club provided were stockings, unquote. They may have looked ragged, but they played with determination. In 1947, the Galstons brought their power to bear on the rest of the league. Dim kept striking out batters and Sweet Hansen kept killing the ball. On July 15th, 1947, the Galstons beat Port Monmouth 19 to zero with Sweet Hansen smacking two home runs, two triples and a double for a perfect day at the plate, and the Golstons won the 1947 Jersey Shore Championships. The following year, they continued their dominance, supplemented by the addition of Ralph Steinberg and his powerful pitching arm. They again won the Jersey Shore Conference, and you see they acquired some nice jerseys that year. Pictured in the upper right is Bill Tila, a longtime great free pitcher, and Fred Rowe, business manager for the Golstons. 
A key player in the Golston team was Dougie Lewis, one of the early black ball players. And here you see Dim cracking a home run for the, for the Golstons in 1946, and Bill Tila doing his thing on the pitching mound. Here you have Frankie Hayes, who we referenced earlier, coming back to Freehold to congratulate his brother, Bobby, on uh, his graduation in 1948. Bobby was the catcher for the team and the star hurler was Ralph Steinberg. Now for his short stint as a pitcher, Ralph was exceptional. In a three week period while in high school, he pitched two no hitters and missed the third by a lead off single. He had tryouts with the St. Louis Cardinals and the Brooklyn Dodgers and in 1951, playing for Dim's Freehold Merchant team, he missed another no-hitter by a single in the last inning, and he struck out 19 batters. Three days later, as is depicted in this article, Ralph beat Belmar and struck out 22 batters, allowing two hits. Ralph ended up becoming a judge in Florida and had the dubious distinction of sentencing Daryl Strawberry to an 18-month sentence. Well, the Golstons ended their playing days in 1950, However, Dim just came up with another team. He convinced the Freehold Merchants to sponsor a team, and the Freehold Merchants were in a very respectable ball club for three years, with Dim as manager, Guggy Lewis, and Dick Skein coaching. The American Legion baseball team had a rebirth after a lapse of five years, and Dim and Al Dangler led this team. Ed Ostrowski, who had pitched a perfect game in high school, was a star pitcher, along with John McCarthy. In 1951, Donnie Cashin, <laughs> sound familiar, well, that's Dim's son and my nephew <laughs> uh, pitched a back-to-back uh, -back no hitter, duplicating Johnny Vandermeer's uh, feat. However, that feat was uh, going to not be stand for very long. 1960, Jimmy Leon of the Cardinals in the local Little League not only matched that feat, but he continued and had six no hitters in his Little League career and added another while pitching for the West Virginia Mountaineers. And at one time, all four of those cashes depicted in this photo played on the same team, the Freehold Townsmen. All right, we move into the 1950s and uh, Little League Baseball uh, had started, and it started actually with the Farm Belt League, uh, which was a precursor to the Freehold Little League, Little League. This league, the Farm Belt League, comprised of St. Rose of Lima and Freehold. English Town had two teams, the Auctioneers and the um, um, Farmers, the English Town Farmers, and Bradenville and the Adelphia Blue Ball Bees. We moved to and from games in the back of Pinky Higgins pickup truck and played our Brandeville games on the grounds of Marlboro State Hospital, believe it or not. Here we have the original St. Rosa Lima team and a shot of the Cardinals, one of the first Little League teams. Trail Little League started in 1951 with many sponsors and spearheaded by Bill Goldstein and Dick Skane. Little League baseball still being played at Wilson Community Park in the Texas area of Freehold, named in honor of Mike Wilson, Freehold's former mayor. The Frio Babe Ruth League team evolved, Babe Ruth evolved from the Little Bigger League, and this league began playing at Nescafe Field in 1954. Here is a picture of an all-star team in 1959 with my brother Dim as the manager, and Gene Briggs and John Kane were coaches of that team. The decade of the 50s could be called the era of no hitters in the combined Little League, Babe Ruth, and high school era. During that decade, there were 26 no hitters by 15 different pitchers. In 1958, okay. we, go ahead. <laughs> there. No. Back one, back one. There's the uh, picture of the Freehold Townsmen in 1958. Great team, great players. Um, a lot of Freehold names are familiar there. Uh, Roger Kane's in that picture, uh, Walt Freeman, uh, my brother's on the left coaching, Albie Prest, uh, uh, Booby Quinn, Gene Glum. On the far right is Sid Blacknall, uh, Sid was a uh, recently had recently moved to Freehold, was a longtime veteran of the Negro Leagues. Several of these players would play for Dim on the Townsman for all seven years. And here's a photo of a later Townsman team with yours truly on the on the left. In a fitting rounding of the baseball circle, here is Dim welcoming Danny Lewis to the Freehold Townsman team. Danny was the son of Guggy Lewis, with whom Dim played on the Golstons in the 1940s. Danny was at this time playing with the Detroit Lions in the NFL. He had hoped to play with the Townsman before departing for the Lion training camp. As it turns out, the Townsman team did not go beyond 64. Dim, as usual, found another team to manage in the Jersey Shore League in 1970s called the County Cedars. 
The curtain finally came down for Dim and for my baseball story when Dim in 1973 at the age of 54 belted a game-winning single to lead Freehold an 11-9 victory over Lindcroft. This would be the last time Dim's name would appear in a box score, a fitting end to my story. So in conclusion, I do believe that Freehold's baseball, baseball history is a microchasm of a small town America during baseball's formative years. Walt Whitman was extolling baseball's virtues from the early 1860s. This quote from 1889 serves to underscore baseball's significance to Americana. Thank you. Don, that was wonderful. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> Hi. That was wonderful. All right, we're gonna, I feel like it's a whole layer of freehold that I knew nothing about. Just, uh, it's so nostalgic, I love it. Let's see. Okay. <laughs> Peter, he wants to, he, he'd like to ask your age. He said your brother was playing in the 1930s yeah. and your father in the 1910s. Yeah, my father was actually playing before the 1910s. I'm 81. Uh, my, when I was born, my father was 58. My father was born in 1888. And my brother was born in 1918. He was 22 when I was born. I was a latecomer. <laughs> um, so I have Russell asking, what did you find were the best references for game accounts for the Monmouth County baseball in the mid 19th century? Newspapers.com was invaluable. It's a, it's a great app. It's a great source of information. It's very user-friendly, uh, free old transcript uh, and all the previous editions of the Monmouth Democrat, Monmouth Inquirer uh, are available. And it, 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 it was wonderful. Uh, I highly recommend it. anybody who's gonna be looking for actually anything regarding Monmouth County, the newspapers.com is a great source. Yeah, it's a great source. Um, someone's asking, can we hear a little bit more about the integration of baseball and freehold? Do you have anything to add to that? Well, you know, I probably could talk about it for quite a while. As I said, there absolutely was no integration in freehold baseball until Hank Skank joined that team um, in 19, and to join the uh, Holy Name team in 1938, along with my brother. Uh, I, 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 I believe my brother brought him aboard. I, I don't know that for a fact. We never talked about it. But you know, during the high school days of the uh, late '40s, early '50s, definitely there were uh, base. You know, there was integration in, in baseball. There just wasn't integration in the Jersey Shore baseball arena until the um, until the early '40s, really. Uh, and and, and uh, Hank Skank was one. Guggy Lewis was another. Uh, John Duckenfield uh, played. I played along with John for several years. Um, so baseball in high school was integrated for some reason. Uh, there wasn't a lot of uh, continuation into the Jersey Shore League. Okay. Uh, somebody's asking, was the Mammoth team playing the fly ball game in the mid to late 1860s? Playing the fly ball game. Not quite That's sure the what that means. Yeah. The Mammoth team uh, was created in 1872, if I remember my facts correctly here. And in 1860, uh, uh, I, I, I guess I'm not quite sure of the question. They, 1860, there were an awful lot of teams playing. I, I think I referenced there were five uh, uh, very embryonic teams in, in effect at that time. But the Mummas, I don't think, were playing until the 1870s. James wants to know if you played ball at Brown University. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. <laughs> yes, I was co-captain of the team. That means you're smarty. Pants, I, I know huh? Jim. Yes. Right. Okay. <laughs> hmm, okay. Uh, I grew up in Essex County and remember attending Sunday games. Any games between the two counties? Between Monmouth and Essex? Um, I, 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 to, off the top of my head, I, I don't know, but I can, I can do some research, uh, Bob. <laughs> it seems like it's pretty localized, right? Yeah, pretty yeah. localized. Well, no, they, they, they brought teams in from Newark and New and Brooklyn and uh, North Jersey, but whether it's from Essex, I'm not quite sure. Okay. Anybody else? Baseball questions? I was very excited when Carl sent the picture of Frankie Hayes and I knew who it was. I was yeah, very proud. Yeah, very impressive. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I may not have pinpointed it when I showed that picture in 1934 in, in Tokyo at the with Frankie Hayes, because the three arrows I didn't reference, but one arrow was, it may be obvious to everybody, was Babe Ruth. The other arrow, arrow to the left was Mo Berg, and the arrow to the right was Frankie Hayes. Okay. Um, 
Mark would like to know, can you explain why the Little League and Babe Ruth fields were located where they were? Okay, hi, Mark. Um, I remember your father very well. Um, my recollection is when, when the Little Bigger League started, um, I'll, talk, I'll talk about Babe Ruth for a minute. Little League started, they were playing at the high school because that was the only available team. They ended up getting uh, permission to play uh, at Institute Street, but, but then they, they obviously did the work at Nescafe, and that's where they ended up playing. As far as Little League is concerned, that was the uh, bequeath of, uh, of Mrs. Parker to allow them to play at Parker Street Field. And they played there for, for many, many years until moving over to the Texas area where they are now, if that helps. Uh, a lot more detail I can provide, Mark, if you wish. Uh, Kevin Coyne, did any other sport even come close to the attention that baseball got? In Freehold, the answer is no. <laughs> Unequivocally, no. I think that's it. Anybody else? Uh, hold start. on, we have a couple more. When did they start playing Little League at the corner of Yellowbrook and Halls Mills? I do not know, Jeff. I, I do not know. Okay. And has a team from Monmouth County ever played in the Little League World Series? Uh, not from Monmouth County, unless people are going to correct me on that. Of course, Tom Jury, yes, but I don't believe Monmouth County. Okay. Mark says no. Yep. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Any more questions? Oh, so he says the 1968 team went to the state championship. Okay. Okay. There were some good little league teams. I just found that amazing about the number of no hitters uh, pitched during that decade. Okay. Right. Well, I think that's it. So I just want to say thank you so much for, hey, we managed to do it between the two of us. It's well, a miracle. With, with your help, yeah. A miracle. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, thank you, everybody, for coming, and I hope to see you at our next lecture in June. So have a good night.